Now, what discredited Johnson's policy was the conduct of these governments that are being set up in the South in, um, in uh, uh, 1865. As I said, nearly all the governors he appointed were, were unionists, no question about it, were, were real supporters of the union. Uh, but many of them were not that astute, partly because they knew that most of the electorate was Confederates. So for example, Benjamin Perry, the, who was appointed governor of South Carolina, who had definitely opposed secession very strongly, uh, and was from the sort of up country, the poorer white area of, um, of South Carolina, he openly proclaimed that the South was better off under, it was good for the South that Lincoln had been assassinated because it was, the South was better off under Johnson than they would have been uh, at Lincoln and that nobody felt more than he did, he said, the humiliation of having to go back into the Union. Now these things are all reported very avidly in the Southern press. I mean, we had on our reading, uh, I guess last week, Sidney Andrews, he's just one of many, many Northern reporters who are floating around the South, sending back by telegram to the New York Tribune and Times and Harper's Weekly and the Chicago Tribune reports on what is going on in the South. Uh, Perry also said that the Dred Scott decision was the law of the land still, and that therefore no black person could be a citizen. So obviously they couldn't vote. Um, then these constitutional conventions met. Not really constitutional conventions, some of them changed the constitution, most of them were just to deal with Johnson's demands. Uh, they seem very, to northerners, very unrepentant. Most of them ratified the 13th Amendment as demanded, although some of them added little codicils, like, yeah, we're ratifying this amendment, but it does not give Congress the authority to legislate about our internal affairs. Mississippi refused to ratify the 13th Amendment. They thought about it a long, long time. Eventually, the state of Mississippi did ratify the 13th Amendment, but that didn't happen until 1995. So it took them a long time to accept, slavery is gone, folks, I'm sorry because they kept wanting compensation for their slaves. They said, we're not ratifying this amendment because there's nothing in it about monetary compensation for the loss of our slave property. Um, and of course, as I mentioned last time, they passed these black codes. The Mississippi Black Code is in the Janap book. You can see some of the provisions there. And um, they're entirely based on forcing the former slaves back to work on plantations with very, very few rights, uh, almost no rights, within, the, within, the, uh, within Southern society. Um, South Carolina refused to repudiate the Confederate debts. Uh, um, uh, Johnson had said, you've got to repudiate the debt. In other words, we're not paying back. But South Carolina said, no, that would be dishonorable. People loan money to the Confederacy and the state of South Carolina, so we should pay them back. In other words, these Southern conventions, the leaders didn't quite think about what the reaction in the North would be to these rather defiant responses to some of Johnson's um, demands. Uh, no state provided that blacks could vote. No state provided any provision for education for the former slaves. Most of the st states provided for um, public relief for Confederate veterans but not for blacks. In other words, they were, you know, people who were poor, et cetera. They said, no, no, that's the federal government's problem. Let them pay these blacks. They're former slaves. They were freed. Let them. But we'll, we'll use our meager resources to compensate uh, Confederate uh, veterans. And then when the elections took place in the fall, uh, many unpardoned people were elected to Congress, to state office, uh, generals, as I said, uh, Alexander Stevens, the vice president of the Confederacy, was elected to the U.S. Senate by uh, Georgia. Most of the Alabama legislators elected had been in the Confederate Army. Um, even William Holden, Johnson's appointee as governor of, uh, of North Carolina, uh, wrote to Johnson, I regret to say there is a rebellious spirit here. They would not have dared to show their heads, but leniency has emboldened them. Leniency, too much leniency. Johnson's policy was a death knell to the actual unionists in the South. Putting blacks aside for a minute, the white union, the real upcountry people like himself who really thought that Johnson would help them gain power, but these elections proved they were not 
that the old Confederate planter elite was going to come back into power if Johnson's policy uh, prevailed. So all of this led to a chorus of denunciation in the North. Now, one of the great myths of Reconstruction is that the North was vindictive toward the South. The Union, they, they, they treated them with terrible harshness. This is absurd. The image that the South was under the heel of bayonet rule is absurd. The army was almost entirely demobilized very quickly. It's very hard to keep a gigantic army like that intact when the war is over. And most of the soldiers who still were around were sent out to the West to fight Indians. Um, this notion of punishment, oh, you'll also read, even nowadays, oh, well, all the white people were disenfranchised. That's ridiculous. That never happened. Some white voters were disenfranchised briefly in 1867. But the idea of oh, the blacks were all given the right to vote and the whites all taken away. No, that is not what happened. I'll show you how pervasive this is. I have a letter here from, um, unfortunately, passed away, the late, very good um, New York Times reporter R.W. Apple. Some years ago, he wrote, this was back in the 90s, he wrote something about the civil war then raging in Bosnia. And uh, he said something to the effect that, um, I hope that when this is over, the victorious side does not show such vindictiveness to the other side as the North showed to the South during Reconstruction. So I wrote a letter to Apple because I respected him. He was the Washington bureau chief of the New York Times. Uh, saying, you know, uh, that's not really the way it was, uh, and I think there's a problem with that whole, the whole, that whole image of vindictiveness is based on the premise that giving rights to black people is a punishment to white people. That's what this is really said. That was the horrible thing the North will eventually do, empower the former slaves. That's the punishment. But this assumes that rights are a zero-sum game. If you expand the rights of one group, you are automatically taking away rights from somebody else. Well, you are taking away their right to run the South without listening to four million of their population. Anyway, Apple writes back to me, I, thank you for your letter, blah, blah, blah. Um, I think your point is well taken as far as it goes. I didn't totally convince him. It's quite true Congress tried to protect the basic rights of the former slaves and hence took actions that offended Southern whites. My use of the word ruthless was therefore wrong, um, and your point prevails. The image of ruthlessness that sticks in my mind, however, just to add some explanation, came from the character of the northerners who were sent south to enforce this. These are the so-called carpet beggars. We'll get to them next week, but it's also a myth. But then he says, maybe the fact that I am married to a South Carolinian has made me... <laughs> South Carolina again. Has made me less careful than I should be about these points. Now, I said to myself, this guy is a very good reporter, but what kind of reporter explains what he wrote by saying, well, my wife told me this? <laughs> what kind, anyone here working on The Spectator? I hope you don't use that kind of journalism. You don't ask your wife what her opinion is and then put that in as historical fact because she's from South Carolina. You know, so it just shows you how hard it is to overturn deeply seated mythologies about Reconstruction. But anyway, on this business of punishment, one, apart from the Lincoln assassins, one Confederate leader was executed. That was Wirtz, the commandant of Andersonville Prison, where thousands of Union prisoners of war died because of the conditions. He was executed for what you might call, you know, war crimes or something. Jefferson Davis was imprisoned but soon released. Stevens, nothing happened to him. He's elected to the Senate. Um, one can easily imagine other scenarios. The leaders of the Confederacy are exiled or jailed for long periods of time. Their, their property is confiscated. The area, the South is held under military rule for 20 years, etc. None of that happened. This notion of punishment is really a, a, a misnomer, but it is deeply embedded in the southern white psyche uh, anyway, if you read uh, things uh, published, published there. But the point is that the conduct, as I said, of these Johnson governments creates tremendous alarm in the North. In the summer and fall of 1865, there's more and more correspondence articles saying the rebellion is not over. The rebellion has not ceased. It has only changed weapons. 
Um, the South seemed to be intent on re-enslaving the former slaves, and this must not be allowed. The Chicago Tribune, in an often quoted statement about the Mississippi Black Code in our book, says, we tell the white men of Mississippi that the men of the North will convert, convert the state of Mississippi into a frog pond before they will allow such laws to disgrace one foot of the soil in which the bones of our soldiers sleep. In other words, this is not what we fought the war for. This is not what the th hundreds of thousands of people have died for. And moreover, reports were flooding into the North of violence against former slaves, mistreatment of Northerners who were down in the South, murders that went unpunished, Northern travelers but being refused accommodation at hotels and inns.